Okay, uh, welcome everyone, uh, both uh, here and uh, online. Uh, we have a uh, really lucky uh, uh, today uh, to have the European Space Agency uh, Director General, uh, Josef Achbacher, uh, uh, joining uh, with us. Um, you know, you know, never mind the flags for you know <laughs> President Macron and uh, so forth. We haven't found enough ESA flags to line uh, <laughs> the next street, time. but uh, you know, we, we we aspire to do that. Um, you know, really delighted uh, to to have him here today. Uh, particularly timely uh, in terms of uh, uh, he's coming here uh, to visit the U.S. Uh, just in the aftermath of a very successful uh, ministerial session, which sets uh, the ESA budget for the next three years. Um, and uh, in a time of uh, war, depression, energy crises, and everything else uh, going on uh, in Europe, uh, I think ESA did uh, did quite well. Uh, maybe not as much as we all aspire to. We always have more desires. As an ex-NASA person, I can always tell you we always wanted more. Um, but I think uh, ESA did uh, very well showing a strong support in Europe uh, for human spaceflight. Uh, from a a more uh, parochial uh, angle, of course, uh, those of you who are tracking the Artemis One mission uh, just past the halfway point and did some nice photographs uh, showing uh, the Earth Moon system uh, from, uh, from a new and unique distance. And in addition to the Orion capsule, of course, what you see in the photograph is the European service module, uh, which uh, is uh, utterly necessary uh, to have gotten us out that far. Uh, and so, uh, uh, European Space Sanction is an integral part of the Artemis. And uh, just, of course, uh, a little bit earlier, uh, we had the successful launch of the uh, James Webb Space Telescope <laughs> on Ariane rocket, a French, uh, French Guiana. And uh, again, spectacular performance uh, that uh, will be uh, revolutionizing science uh, for, for many years to come. Uh, that doesn't mean everything is great. Uh, there's a number of very serious challenges uh, to Europe, uh, particularly human future of human spaceflight, launch vehicles, uh, as well as things like orbital debris and uh, uh, worrying about the, the future of the space environment, uh, as well as the earthly environment. So uh, never a dull moment. Uh, you can, uh, you can have a bio uh, for him in front, so I won't uh, read through uh, uh, all of that. Uh, I just want to welcome him to the podium and uh, look forward to your remarks. Sure. Thank you. So thank you, thank you very much. And first of all, thank you for inviting me and uh, to speak uh, to you both online and uh, and here in the room. It's a real pleasure to be here. And if I tell you that uh, last week uh, we were all exhausted, uh, myself probably more than many others, uh, because we were sleeping very little, uh, working until very deep uh, in the night. Uh, but my first trip after the ministerial is here to Washington uh, because it uh, is really important for for us in, in Europe and uh, for, for me uh, as PG of ESA to inform our key partners with whom we work together. You mentioned uh, Artemis, you mentioned the European Service Module. We are very grateful for being a good partner of NASA and of the United States in, uh, in many of these missions. And uh, I would like to update you on where we stand, of what we have achieved, uh, at least in terms of budgets and proposals from our member states, and also where we want to go, what the next ambitions are and the next challenges are. So I've put together a couple of slides um, just to recall some of the, the elements of uh, what we're doing and, uh, and where what the direction is. What, what you see here, European Space Agency, of course, you know it, um, but just uh, some facts and figures. We are about 6,000 people uh, across several establishments. 60% uh, uh, of the public money of uh, Europe is spent through ESA. The other 40%, you may wonder where they are being spent. The other 40% are spent uh, through the European Commission, UMILSAT, uh, national space agencies like CNES, uh, DLR, RC, uh, UK Space Agency, and several others. So it is really the fact that uh, through ESA, we are shaping the major space programs and also spending uh, most of the uh, public uh, uh, funding, which, uh, which is given by governments. Of course, this uh, is meant to establish large programs, uh, major multinational programs uh, within Europe, having most of the partners, if not all the member states on board, uh, and in some cases, partners uh, outside Europe, that means uh, particularly in the United States, but also Japan and uh, several other countries. Our budget is uh, 7 billion, it's maybe small compared to NASA, but uh, we, we are doing, uh, we're trying to do as much as we can with this funding. And in some cases, I think we, we, we succeed pretty well. And 
Others, of course, we are a relatively small partner, but, but what is important is that we want to be a good partner, a very good partner to our international partners like NASA in order to really provide reliable technology, which you need. Uh, and therefore, I'm really grateful for the participation in Artemis uh, through the ESM, the European Service Model, because this is a, a large uh, trust which uh, the United States has put on, on us uh, as ESA. And I'm very happy, very humbled uh, to be in such a partner in such an important mission. And this is something I really would like to to foster, to strengthen, uh, and to increase our share, our contribution to remain a strong, reliable partner for, uh, for the United States. So what are we doing? Uh, what you see here are some examples of uh, some of the programs and activities we do, which just uh, a few highlights. Uh, we do, of course, uh, a lot of different satellite missions, uh, launcher missions, uh, science, and so on. Independent access to space, of course, is critical, as you I don't need to explain this in, in this one here. We have uh, two large, uh, medium and large uh, launcher programs, Vega and Ariane. Uh, we have uh, just uh, had the maiden launch of uh, Vega C uh, in July of this year. Uh, Ariane 6, uh, we are getting to the launch pad. Uh, we are not yet uh, having the maiden flight, uh, but we still have uh, some Ariane 5 uh, flights uh, uh, to take uh, place. But we're aiming at the uh, Ariane 6 uh, maiden flight at the end of next year. Then, of course, technological sovereignty, a key element, uh, but also uh, using data uh, from space and combining them with other information, uh, Earth system models, uh, using high performance computing, creating digital twins of our planet, uh, which you see here on the right hand side of right, uh, that we are producing a lot of data every single day with the Copernicus program through the Sentinels, and these data are disseminated over the world for free to anyone of any place uh, within uh, uh, within the few hours of uh, after the satellite passes over. So this is really a huge uh, yeah, system that allows to monitor our planet. We say take the pulse of our planet and then really bring this data uh, to users worldwide. Then, of course, on the bottom, you see Galileo, the VRS signal, uh, which is the very high resolution uh, signal. Metrology, another example where we build for Humansat uh, our geostationary and polar orbiting satellites. Uh, we're launching MTG, the next MTG uh, in uh, December, uh, in less than a month from today, which will be quite a a big step, a uh, big uh, satellite with uh, about 10 different instruments, uh, very uh, advanced technologies and instrumentation, uh, which will be launched uh, very soon with Ariane 5 from Kourou. And then, of course, you need to show a world-class uh, image of uh, the James Webb Space Telescope, uh, which is quite amazing. Uh, and this is something where we are also a partner of uh, NASA, very happy partner of NASA. We provide one and a half out of the four scientific instruments, as you probably know, uh, plus uh, a lot of the science team and science projects were involved, and of course, the launch uh, last year uh, from Kourou on Christmas Day, which, uh, which is something that uh, I think went uh, very well because it ejected um, the James Webb Space Telescope quite precisely into orbit, and therefore extending the lifetime, almost doubling the lifetime, uh, which I think is, uh, is very important. Talking of budget, um, you know uh, you're in the midst of it, uh, where it really happens. Uh, you have uh, uh, through NASA, a very strong, uh, very powerful source of uh, public funding, uh, which is uh, something we in Europe always admire. Uh, we always look uh, at the NASA budget as a reference. Of course, the factor there's a factor in between the ESA budget and the NASA budget. You see the ESA total here in a, a few steps below. Uh, this is the civilian budget of NASA. So there we have about one third of the civilian budget. Of course, there's also budget in the, in the defense community, which is a uh, defense part of uh, of NASA, which is not shown here, but is uh, probably of the same order of magnitude, uh, including the Space Force and uh, other defense budgets in space. And then what you see is this yellow curve. Uh, again, you know it uh, because uh, a lot happens here in the US is uh, private investments. Uh, and these are many medium and smaller sized uh, companies, uh, SMEs, startups uh, funded through venture capital uh, funds in Silicon Valley or many other places, but also the big ones uh, like uh, SpaceX, uh, and of course, uh, Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk, uh, Richard Branson being uh, really the people who are, uh, who are changing the world in space uh, through major investments which they are taking, which they're doing. And uh, this is something that is also very inspiring and something that uh, has really changed our world in space significantly, of course, here in the, in the States, but also uh, for us in Europe. So this is uh, uh, showing some of the domains where we are uh, investing. Again, these are just a few examples. 
where commercialization, of course, comes stronger into play. That means co-funding or private companies uh, funding space activities, uh, sometimes with a large share of public funding, sometimes with a smaller share of public funding, uh, going from climate, climate to in-orbit servicing to space connectivity or human space transportation. And here, of course, uh, commercial LEO is one of the main domains that is being developed. And I will say a couple of words uh, on these domains, what we do in Europe, uh, but certainly these are priorities where in Europe also we are working, we are building up uh, activities and projects, uh, uh, as I said, quite often inspired by what happens uh, here in the US uh, by many of these uh, companies, but certainly uh, a domain where we believe uh, in Europe uh, that this is um, something where public money can really stimulate private investments, uh, new business opportunities, new companies, new services that are then brought uh, to the market. These are again uh, comparisons of different uh, budgets, uh, um, just to put things in context, and I think it again shows the clear leadership of uh, the US in terms of uh, investments uh, in space. You see at the very top, 0.243% uh, uh, of uh, GDP is uh, invested in space, uh, by far uh, the largest uh, uh, share or contribution of uh, public uh, space funding. Then followed, interestingly, by Russia, uh, then uh, Saudi Arabia, France, Japan, and then the, the yellow bar is the, the European Union and ESA member states. Uh, you see this is uh, 0. 0.0. 66%, which is about a quarter of uh, the investments uh, in the States. Uh, this is uh, for the year 2019, but uh, uh, many of the years are very, very similar. And then you see, of course, a number of other, uh, of other countries. Um, on the right-hand side, and that's quite, uh, quite interesting, you see this uh, yellow uh, magenta and red bars uh, for uh, China, Russia, and uh, the US, where uh, these three countries are customers, but the color so the size, uh, the length of the bar means uh, the, the uh, uh, tons of spacecraft or uh, of technology that is brought into space. Of course, tons is a very crude measure, but you, uh, all the spacecraft are very sophisticated uh, uh, spacecraft with instrumentation electronics on board, but tons is one crude measure of, uh, of expressing it. And you see that the US is uh, the largest uh, contributor of uh, space technology uh, and has launched uh, the highest uh, amount of, uh, of weight uh, in this particular case uh, into space. But the red column also means that it, it is provided or the supplier is also US companies. So uh, red uh, high bar means uh, a lot of uh, spacecraft. The red color means uh, from that particular country. And as you see, uh, it's mostly provided by the US. Same for China, same for Russia. And then you see uh, Europe, first of all, much smaller. So the amount of uh, space technology launched by Europe is, uh, where, where Europe is a customer, is much smaller. Uh, and also in the box, there are some colors, small ones, but uh, different colors, again, mostly European uh, suppliers, but also some others. But then on the right-hand side, which says other customers, that's other countries like South Korea or Chile or some other uh, countries in the world, and there you see which other country is providing uh, this technology. Uh, you see the, again, the dark blue is, uh, is Europe, uh, red is uh, the US, uh, then the light blue is, uh, I think, uh, light blue, I think, is uh, some other uh, providers. But you see there that uh, also Europe is having a good share of other customers, that means export uh, in our uh, language, uh, where European companies provide also space technology for other customers worldwide, which is good uh, because uh, since our home market is limited, uh, some of it is also exported uh, to outside. So this is the starting point, and this was uh, a bit the, the context and the reasoning uh, why and how our Agenda 2025 is launched and what, uh, what, the, what it uh, says. Agenda 2025 is the strategy of ESA. Uh, 2025 is the the end of my mandate as DG, and usually a new DG, when he comes into office, he puts a document on the table and says, what does he or she want to do in the next couple of years? What are the priorities and what are, are the investments uh, through ESA, which uh, the member states uh, want to see? And this is the document that says that if you, have, if you haven't read it yet, I can really uh, encourage you doing so. It's actually quite thin. Uh, we have made sure that it's not more than 12 pages or so, but it starts with a very interesting first page, uh, and I'm not saying what it is, but it's uh, worth just looking at the first page because it gives you a bit of picture of where we want to go in the next decade. And I think this is something you is worth picking it up. But what it says is, uh, what are the priorities of Europe uh, in space? And you see on the left-hand side, five bullets. 
And these are really the five domains where we think, where I put together, together with, uh, of course, my member states, I consulted them before this document was written, uh, what we should be doing, where we should be focusing in Europe to move space forward. One is strengthening the relationship between the European institutions, that means the European Union, uh, and European Space Agency, but also other institutions in Europe. And this is something that has not always been very rosy, just to be very, very clear, but this is something that I really want to achieve. I have been working in the European Union for some years. I've been working with them for many decades, and this is a priority that I really want to establish to work well together with our European partners, not only our member states, but also our partners in Brussels uh, and other European institutions. This is a bit more the in-house uh, cuisine, if I may say, but certainly boosting commercialization is a thematic priority. Commercialization, no need to be uh, explained, is uh, making sure that uh, what we see very successfully implemented in the States, uh, making sure that we can do similar things in, in, in Europe at a larger scale. And uh, maybe I uh, tell you a small private story. When I became director of Earth Observation, which was the previous post uh, before becoming DG, this was in 2015. And in Earth Observation 2015, some of you may remember, these new constellations were just uh, starting to begin. Spire, uh, planet, uh, were just beginning, but not really well established yet. And of course, you read about these uh, constellations and these activities in news magazines in uh, different articles, and you think this is great, and this is what something that happens, but what does it mean? So at that time, and you have to think back to 2015, I said to myself, this is where we need to change in Europe. We are too old-fashioned, we are too uh, conservative, too traditional. I have to rock the boat if I simplify a bit, and I have to really introduce change at a large scale at that time as director of Earth observation. So what I did is I said to my, my next uh, level in the hierarchy, uh, my managers uh, who build satellites, I said, look, we have to change. We are, this is happening, planet is happening, and other things are in the making. Artificial intelligence playing a key role we have to change. And they looked at me and said, look, change. What change is needed? We're so successful with wonderful satellites. What do we need to change? I said, look, it is happening and we have to change. So what um, I did is I, I took uh, 10 of them, the top uh, senior managers, and went for 10 days to Silicon Valley. And we went to Planet, to Spire, to SpaceX, and to many of these companies, and really tried to understand them, how they work, what drives them, and what is needed to be successful in the commercialization part. And to make the long story short, after a 10 days trip, it was eye-opening uh, for us, certainly in, uh, in Europeans uh, seeing all that. I mean, visiting SpaceX, as you can imagine, is uh, already quite impressive. And this was uh, 10 years ago, and today it's even more impressive. Uh, so what I sat down, and I still remember we sat down in a, in a bar uh, at the end of the 10 days, and we reflected, what did we learn? And if I summarize what we learned is, in order to be successful and take on this commercialization, I said, we, you need three things. Number one, you need brilliant people with brilliant ideas who have the energy to do it. So people. Number two, you need access to money. In Silicon Valley, not a big problem because it is along one stretch. There's a lot of it which you can find and you can organize easy, easily or easier. Number three, speed. You need to be fast. And you need to take risk, fall on your nose, stand up again, walk, and run. So if I take these three things, uh, and I translate this to Europe, of course, in America, all three work very well. Uh, in Europe, talent and brilliant people is something we have. Uh, and I think I'm really happy to say that the talent pool is great. We have some really incredibly talented, energetic people who have, have everything they need to do in order to realize an idea, and they have many, many brilliant ideas. What we don't have, and this is something I'm working on very intensely, is access to money is not so easy in Europe as it is in, in the US. Access to money is a problem. And I quote one of the CEOs of one of the stock listed companies today when I met him. Uh, I said, uh, tell me a bit your story. Uh, this was a district uh, Silicon Valley almost 10 years ago. And he said, look, I'm coming from Austria. I've applied for a research project. It took me half a year. I've got zero euros, zero answer. I got a bit of reply. We're waiting, we're processing, but nothing happened. So he was impatient. He left. He went to the UK. Uh, he said, uh, same in the UK. Okay, there he got 300K after a couple of weeks, but at least something happened. So the UK is much more Anglo-Saxon in the culture and this worked. 
And then he said, still not good enough because I need it much more, much faster. This has to be much more, more much more funding for, for the ideas he has. Went to Silicon Valley, uh, opened a company here, and within a very few weeks, he got uh, a million uh, to start up and, uh, and uh, get going with this company. Today, the company is uh, listed on the stock market, uh, very successful, one of these uh, new space companies that is, uh, that is doing extremely well. But this tells the story that uh, the talents are going away because they don't find opportunities back home. And that's something I really would like to, to ensure access to money. And what I've done since I became each year, a year and a half ago, I've now made agreements with uh, a number of venture capital companies or funding institutions, 19, so uh, more than one a month, uh, 19, uh, which I've signed, where we offer access to technology, to startups, uh, to, to young companies uh, with brilliant ideas. And we make the connection to the funding institutions, which are very interested in using us ESA as a technical neutral reference in order to create business opportunities. And therefore, they find the opportunities, they make business deals, and they then develop a company or something. So this is happening. Uh, and I'm very happy to, to see it growing. It actually picks up uh, quite nicely. Um, and, uh, is doing pretty well. The third thing is speed. We're still way too slow, uh, way too conservative, way too traditional. And that's something I really want to change and I will change. And this is one of the highlights or focus I have on ESA for next year. Uh, now we had focused on the ministerial, but next year I really would like to change our organization to be much more responsive, much faster, time to contract, speed in order to interact with the new space uh, uh, companies and community, which are very impatient and rightly so, and uh, we need to be to simplify our procedures and uh, be uh, simply much more dynamic. So this is commercialization, just to give you a flavor of uh, what and how we do it. Uh, safety, security, don't need to explain it these days, I think uh, with the war in front of our door in, in, in Europe. Safety, of course, means also safety in orbit for our satellites, uh, debris uh, and uh, related uh, activities, security, obviously, security on the ground. Program challenges, uh, we have a number of program challenges. We have to look into a bit deeper. Uh, I mentioned launches, that's one of them, not the only one. Uh, so to really dive into and see what is the problem, what is at the core of the problem, get them off and make sure that they are finding a way forward. Uh, sometimes it's a management issue, sometimes a financial issue, sometimes technology, it really depends a bit on the case. And is a transformation, as I mentioned before, be more dynamic, faster, simplify processes, but of course, being a public institution, always having enough oversight, controls, checks and uh, balances in place in order for member states to uh, confidently give money to each other. Where we are good on the right hand side is certainly in navigation, earth observation, science and telecoms. There we have, uh, I think, uh, world class uh, programs and I mentioned Copernicus, uh, Galileo, uh, uh, telecom. We have uh, geostationary community or satellites that are really good and space science. Uh, we have a number of really top class uh, space science missions. Of course, we work in many cases with international partners, but that's a strength which we have where we have very, very good programs. Where we have weaknesses or, or, or what you call untapped opportunities, a bit more elegantly formulated, are some points like reusable launches. We don't have one today. And this is something that uh, needs to change. Broadband internet, again, uh, we have nothing today and we are uh, actually launching a program uh, right now. We've started to launch it uh, already. And exploration, we have put in exploration, very good, but small, uh, quite small. And our budget in Europe is 7%, used to be 7% of the budget of NASA in exploration. Now with the huge increase, it's probably 10%, but it's still relatively modest compared to NASA. NASA's exploration budget on Mars, Moon, uh, and low Earth orbit. But I think the contributions we provide are good, strong, solid, as we see in the ESM and similar activities. Meaning that we really need to invest um, in several domains, especially those with commercial opportunities. Let me show you this. And this shows a little bit uh, the ambition I've expressed uh, to my countries uh, and to my people in-house. This is uh, where we are uh, today. Uh, on the bottom, you see autonomy. So space technology, autonomous uh, countries, and on the y-axis, you, you see capacity. And you see, of course, the United States at the very top right uh, corner, but also China doing extremely well. I don't need to explain, you, you know it. Uh, Russia having a very strong autonomy, capacity a bit below, but uh, still very, very strong, as you all know. And Europe being somewhere with a good capacity, but not the autonomy that uh, uh, we would probably like to have. And my goal would be to move from where we are today in 10 years to where 
uh, somewhere in the United States, maybe not that close, but in the same box in the same area, certainly to increase our capacity uh, and our autonomy uh, to, to have a stronger space capability in Europe. Also, to be a stronger, good, reliable partner, trusted partner of NASA and other space agencies uh, uh, worldwide. I'm doing this in steps. We just had CIMIN 22, which is our ministerial conference, which finished last week. The next one will be in 25, and this is a stepwise approach. It's not a one-off thing, which we had last week, which was very successful, but it's not a one-off thing. It is something where I really want to build up a path towards this top right-hand corner, which, uh, which you see here. And this is the roadmap uh, which we have uh, laid out um, starting in 2021 uh, with some activities that have already happened. Maybe I mentioned the Space Summit, which is the, thir the third one in this in the row, the Space Summit. For the first time ever in Europe, we organized a Space Summit involving the ESA member states and the EU member states uh, at top level, at high level. Mr. Macron, who is uh, here in uh, Washington right now, was at the Space Summit gave a fantastic, inspiring speech and telling his view of uh, what Europe should be doing in space in general and in space exploration in particular, uh, and uh, really lifting space one level higher in terms of uh, political attention, which I think is necessary in order to come to this right hand, uh, top right hand box, which I mentioned before. We just had the ministerial, which is the box next to it or the circle next to it. Uh, we'll say a, a few words in a minute. And then I plan a second space summit uh, at the end of next year uh, will likely take place in Spain. Uh, it's not yet fully confirmed, but this is the plan where uh, the focus will be on space exploration, human exploration. Uh, and uh, you all know what this means. And I will say a couple of words on what we are planning to do in this. Talking of space summit, this was the one in Toulouse. So uh, you recognize the gentleman on the right hand side, uh, President Macron. Uh, next to him is uh, Commissioner Breton and myself. And this was really for the first time that we did bring this topic of space to the top level leadership in order to really debate it at this level uh, in a coherent uh, way. And last week, uh, accelerating the use of space in Europe. This is our ministerial conference uh, just a couple of days ago, again, with uh, all the uh, leaders of uh, uh, the 22 European countries plus the European Commission. So this is the result of it. Uh, almost 17 billion, 16.923 billion, and broken down into these different circles or these different domains. The one that increased by far the most, not, not by the most, but in, in absolute terms, in terms of money, is human and robotic exploration. So now we have a much stronger, solid program on uh, exploring Mars, Moon, and low Earth orbit. On Mars, we have uh, decided to relaunch uh, ExoMars. ExoMars, as you know, we have uh, worked actually with the United States uh, until some 15, 12, 13 years ago. Uh, then uh, we this was discontinued. Then we started uh, our cooperation with Russia, uh, which uh, actually brought us to the stage that we could have launched ExoMars in September this year. And uh, the rover would actually call, or not yet, but uh, soon call on the Mars surface uh, if uh, the war would not have happened. But of course, with uh, the Ukraine war, uh, we immediately terminated this cooperation. That means we, we stopped all the cooperation we had. We have invested already more than 1 billion, 1.1 billion euros uh, in ExoMars. We stopped all that uh, and we reassessed uh, our options. Uh, and now I put a proposal to our ministers and said, look, we need to find a way forward. I don't want to put ExoMars in the museum, uh, which will be a very expensive piece of, uh, of hardware. I want ExoMars to fly. Uh, to go to the Rosalind Franklin rover, go to Mars, drill into the surface. You have to imagine this is the only mission today which has a drill that goes underground, uh, drills into the surface two meters and looks for, for traces of uh, ancient of microbic life uh, to see whether or not there has been any or there's still any traces of life out there uh, because on the surface we know there is no life. But if there's any traces of uh, past life then or existing life, then it might be underground. Uh, and this is uh, the way where we look at it. So yes, ExoMars uh, has been agreed, decided and funded, and will now uh, go forward. Uh, we're doing this now, mostly European, but also with some key components from the US, uh, three components in particular, RHU, radio isotope heater units, uh, plus uh, the launcher that goes with it, uh, to be launched uh, from US uh, soil, and uh, braking engine in order to land uh, the, the lander safely on the, on the Mars surface. And the other, 
parts, uh, there are four different elements of the whole mission. The other parts are all uh, Europeanized. Also agreed um, was, was another major infrastructure development called EL3, European Large Logistic Lender, which is a large uh, yeah, logistic lender bringing one and a half tons of mass to the, to the moon surface uh, and uh, building up uh, habitats on the moon or whatever you want to transport uh, to the moon. And this is uh, the beginning of a big project, we call it also Argonaut, uh, which will be used for uh, lunar uh, exploration. And in this red bar, uh, also included are all our commitments we have to the United States for the Artemis program and for the ISS. That means uh, the ESMs up to ESM9, uh, the operation of the ISS until 2000, the end of 2025, and then, of course, con uh, continued with the next uh, funding slice, plus uh, IHUB, S3, which are parts of the gateway, uh, which uh, we are, where we are working very closely hand in hand with NASA. So I'm very happy about that uh, because this is a very important element and I've increased this human and robotic exploration part quite significantly. Space safety means space debris, space weather, uh, which uh, where we have several missions, uh, HERA uh, and Vigil in particular, but also other elements like in-orbit services uh, and uh, uh, smaller satellites, which we are launching in this domain. Space transportation is our launcher program with uh, Ariane Vega, uh, space Rider, which will be a reusable uh, uh, transporter uh, into space. Uh, then uh, also, of course, the infrastructure in Kourou is funded through this and a program to stimulate micro launches uh, where we act as an anchor customer to buy launches uh, from uh, several of these commercial suppliers that are coming up in the world. Earth observation, looking after our planet, uh, very strong program, one of the big ones in, uh, in ESA. Uh, has a number of satellites uh, looking at different components. Uh, some of these missions we do together with the US. Uh, some of you may know Sentinel-6, Michael Feilig. Michael Feilig used to be uh, US uh, NASA uh, head of uh, Earth Sciences. And uh, uh, we have actually named our satellite in his honor uh, to really honor the contribution of uh, him personally, but also NASA in this cooperation, which is a fantastic cooperation which we have. Uh, plus uh, several other Earth observation satellites we do, also Copernicus, next generation new technologies, uh, Earth explorers, uh, which we are developing here, plus one mission called Aelos, Aelos 2, which is the second of, uh, of a series of uh, missions having, having an, a UV LIDAR on board, uh, an ultraviolet a LIDAR to measure, uh, to measure wind speed and direction in cloud-free uh, atmosphere, something that uh, doesn't exist uh, anywhere else uh, except for Aelos 1, which is running right now extremely important measurements for improved weather forecast and improved uh, understanding of our planet. And telecom and integrated applications, there we start developing a secure connectivity constellation in low Earth orbit, uh, together with some other technology developments uh, in telecom. Commercialization is a bit uh, misplaced. It says only 1%, but if you add up all the programs that have a commercial uh, commercial drive with co-funding by different partners, it's actually one and a half billion and not only 118 million, so it's uh, more than a factor of 10 higher than what you see here, but those other elements are under Earth observation, space transportation, and so on. Base, uh, basic activities, uh, running some of our basic uh, programs in uh, infrastructure elements, uh, buildings, uh, but also IT, cybersecurity, and other things. And the science program, the big missions being Athena and Lisa, uh, which are quite exciting programs. Some of it we also do uh, with, the, uh, with the states. This is a bit the comparison of the budgets. Um, and some of you may have heard that I was proposing budgets or uh, uh, program proposals or programs worth 18.5 billion. This is the figure on the left uh, side here. And on the middle, you see the subscription on the right hand side, the rate of subscriptions and how many percentage were subscribed. So you may say 91% uh, on average is not good. It is very good. Uh, I tell you that uh, typically in our ministerial conferences, we get about 90% subscription. It's always good to have more ideas than money. The other way around, I think, would be a problem. Uh, but this is a normal rate, a standard rate of, uh, of uh, subscriptions that you have. Uh, you raise the bar at a certain level, and then you reach about 90% subscriptions, 91% in this case. So this is a quite normal procedure. But this 17% increase, uh, which we got uh, compared to last year, it's 17%. You have to see in 2022 economic conditions. That means uh, the inflation this year is probably 10%, roughly. That means uh, if Germany provides 1 billion uh, as its contribution for 
this, let's say for next year's budget, this 1 billion, we can ask actually 1.1 billion. So this 16.9 billion, you can add some 15 or so percent on top, which is the money we're actually calling up from the member states in the program. So it's actually more than uh, what the figure shows because the majority of the programs is in 2022 economic conditions. Therefore, meaning we add the inflation and we call up the higher value uh, over the next years when the programs are implemented and the satellite or rocket is being developed. So this is really a fantastic uh, uh, result. And I can say that uh, personally, I'm very relieved uh, on the on this result because it's uh, it's quite something in times like this, as you said at the beginning, uh, we have uh, an inflation in most countries of around 10%. We have an energy crisis. We have a war in front of our door. We just came out of the COVID crisis and putting all, all this together, getting an increase is already good. Get, getting a 17% increase is excellent. A 17 increase plus inflation on top is actually quite magnificent. And I think this is really showing that the member states are buying into this concept of Agenda 25. They are engaged and they've really committed their money to fund the programs which have been proposed. And I think this is something, a message I really would like to convey that we we are on a good path. We are, we are a strong partner for programs where we work with you. And I think that's something that uh, you want to see and I'm very happy to uh, report to you. So this would boost Europe through several Elements, uh, of course, world class science, technology innovation, uh, commercial growth. Uh, I've mentioned some of these elements before. And then the uh, lower part you see for what? Uh, for sustainability on Earth, uh, climate change in particular, uh, but also other sustainability and in space. The uh, debris monitoring was one of the elements. And reinforcing our autonomy and sovereignty, especially in view of uh, what happened with the invasion of Russia, where we had huge dependencies. I mentioned ExoMars, but also Soyuz was a a problem uh, that uh, suddenly occurred on the 24th of uh, February, but also components, uh, smaller technologies, uh, raw materials, and many other things where we worked with Russia and uh, from one day to the next cannot work anymore. Plus, of course, inspiration. This is the driver that I really would like to inspire young people to study science, to study mathematics, to study physics, uh, go into space and just be fascinated by space uh, as some of us uh, have been inspired by some of the Apollo missions or similar programs, and I think we should create similar inspiration to our people. Let me now show some of the examples, and I'm going a bit faster for this one, just for you to, to see a bit what's on the menu and what we have agreed. So on space science, uh, we have uh, two missions. I mentioned Athena and Lisa, uh, one uh, looking into black holes, the other one in gravitational waves, uh, some very abstract uh, uh, topics, but you know them very well here at uh, George uh, Washington University, uh, something that is really, these will be large missions. Uh, uh, we do them uh, also in cooperation with NASA uh, and uh, one of them also with uh, Japan. Uh, but this is really our, what we call the large scale missions of the next uh, program of ODISA. I mentioned exploration, the so-called Argonaut, the European large log logistic lander on the left, uh, which brings her uh, uh, which transports uh, goods or uh, elements to the moon. On the right-hand side, uh, ExoMars recovery, uh, as mentioned before, uh, again, uh, with uh, some cooperation elements uh, of the United States uh, through NASA. Next one is uh, showing a bit our European exploration calendar and activities, uh, which are really spanning a number of uh, different uh, uh, actions and programs, including the ISS, uh, of course, low Earth orbit, and then future commercial uh, LEO uh, activities as they come. Uh, moon activities, as mentioned before, there's one in addition, which I didn't mention yet, which is Moonlight, uh, where we develop a constellation of navigation and telecommunication satellites around the moon uh, for communication on and around the moon for robots, uh, but also astronauts, uh, in order to make sure that we have navigation and communication once the infrastructure is being established. And then on Mars, as I mentioned before, ExoMars and our participation Mars simply return with NASA as a very important element of this cooperation. Earth observation, I've mentioned the ILOS 2 mission. Truth is another one, Harmony is an Earth Explorer, where we uh, develop uh, where we where we develop technology that doesn't exist yet uh, to answer burning questions of science, uh, which the scientists are posing to us, uh, a bit similar to the decadal survey questions that are being raised in the Earth Science Program in the US. And also we have a mechanism that is doing that uh, uh, and uh, providing satellite infrastructure to, the, to respond to that. Navigation. Um, navigation, of course, apart from uh, establishing the Galileo system, which we do uh, with and for the European Union. 
we also uh, develop new technologies. One of them is low Earth orbit uh, PNT, uh, which is uh, uh, navigation signals at lower Earth orbit in order to increase the accuracy even further. Uh, today, the Galileo signal is the most accurate uh, worldwide, and we want to further increase the accuracy uh, through this PNT, but also GNSS for science uh, investments and developments. Telecom integrated applications, I mentioned secure connectivity, uh, where we are at the beginning of building up a constellation. Uh, there will be, this is done with the European Union, you see in the top right hand uh, corner the EU flag, uh, where we work with them to call industry to co-invest and really build up a commercial or uh, yeah, commercial, commercially driven uh, constellation in um, uh, for broadband internet, one for more hard, for hard uh, government services, and the other one uh, more for commercial services. Moonlight, I mentioned, civil security from space. Again, um, I think the name explains what we do. And on how this uh, quantum communication, uh, satellite uh, communication technology developments, uh, which we carry out. Space transportation, I've mentioned, our launcher uh, portfolio, where we prepare also the future through reusability, which uh, is certainly something that, that we need to invest to make sure that uh, we have also this capability in Europe. Space safety. Uh, we are already working on a mission uh, called Clear Space One, which is uh, actively taking a debris from orbit and bringing it down and uh, removing it uh, from orbit. This is an upper stage of, uh, of a Vega, but also in orbit servicing. You see Adrios here on the right hand side, uh, plus uh, Hera and Vigil, uh, which have been uh, approved at the ministerial conference. Then, uh, just one word on uh, zero debris. Uh, what we also have agreed uh, this is more policy decision is that uh, ESA wants to work uh, with its European partners towards uh, a zero debris policy. That means by 2030, we would like to achieve that our missions are, if they're going up to space, are removed from orbit. In other words, like in a, in a national park, when you go into a national park, you have garbage which you take with you, you take it back out again, so that nothing remains in the national park, in this case, in orbit in terms of debris. So this should become a, a guideline uh, that should be binding by the end of this decade for our missions, but of course we also want to inspire others, uh, uh, European partners, uh, uh, both our industrial partners, but also others uh, to adhere to that. And that's quite an important uh, aspect. But also climate change, obviously through Earth Observation Digital Twins, where we work very closely with a number of uh, companies and uh, partners to really use our satellites to the maximum capability to monitor our planet. Then you see something on the bottom right, called Solaris, uh, which is space-based solar power, uh, where we run a feasibility study. I uh, know this is quite uh, discussed whether it works or it doesn't work technology-wise, uh, financially, whether it is a uh, concept that stands uh, and uh, survives the test. But what we do is we invest about 60 million uh, from our first uh, subscriptions to test technologies, but also do more intense uh, feasibility studies, uh, commercial uh, evaluations of whether this is a concept a concept that is also commercially viable. Uh, we don't know the answer today, uh, but certainly this is worth uh, investigating further. And that's why we allocate a couple of tens of millions to really go deeper uh, and prepare then if this works uh, decisions in the uh, next ministerial and then eventually build up uh, a system if it works. If it works, we would aim at uh, gigawatt size uh, power plants in space, uh, photovoltaic plants, which beam down uh, the, the energy to the, to the surface, collect it here, and then of course use it uh, uh, for various purposes. This is so-called base load. And this would, if it works, this would be quite a game changer uh, for many of us, uh, uh, even for not only in Europe, but this uh, would uh, be something quite interesting worldwide. But I'm holding my breath. I'm not yet claiming a victory in this. There's a lot of uh, technology work that needs to be undertaken. You have to imagine assembling these huge infrastructures in space, uh, beaming power down at this scale is a huge thing that has never been done. Uh, and there's a lot of uh, questions whether this works or doesn't work, and this is something we need to investigate. Then we have uh, a concept called accelerators and inspirators. This is not something that we have uh, put on the table for the ministerial, because this is something I wanted to focus on after the ministerial to see, and in, in a few words, uh, and this uh, applies to the accelerators, how can space be used much wider in the society, not only in the space domain. If I take uh, space for a green future, there are hundreds of billions of dollars or euros allocated to uh, decarbonizing our economy and reaching carbon neutral 
economies by the by mid of this century. And this is huge investments that are that are made. I would like to see in each of those where space can play a role and if space can improve. And there are already some encouraging figures. Um, uh, there are some studies that say that uh, with today's technology, we can already save about one and a half gigatons of CO2 uh, if applied properly to better managing traffic, uh, both on the road, in the air, uh, and uh, therefore reduce carbon emissions. And that is huge. 1.5 gigatons uh, is four times the emission of the whole of the United Kingdom or the equivalent of 50 million cars for the whole lifetime. So it's a, it's a huge amount uh, of, uh, of carbon reduction, which we can do with space technologies. So you can imagine if this is really applied and further developed, what this means uh, for decarbonization. Inspirators, human space flight. This is something I really would like to develop uh, uh, in Europe as a topic. This is a political decision, not a, a technical decision. And this is something I want to raise for the Space Summit uh, at the end of next year. And this is it. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much. I guess there may be questions. I don't know about how this normally works, but are there any yeah. questions, discussions, uh, feedback? I see a lot of students here. I have a lot of no questions. Go ahead. Can you speak a bit louder? Sorry. Uh, my question is about the role of the rule of use as a patron and uh, intersectoral growth that you spoke about the rule of use applications that have joint purposes in the security uh, sector and the civil space. Do they keep to an increased budget allocation? Yeah. Or do they? I mean, you may know or you may hear that Europe works for peaceful purposes in space. So this is uh, certainly what is written in our convention. But we're doing we work a lot in dual use uh, uh, applications or projects, you, you, uh, as you mentioned. Uh, I've added up uh, all the projects uh, where dual use, or let's say some defense or security elements are part of, uh, uh, part of uh, our application. There are more than 100 of those dual use projects uh, where we are, which we are having today already running since decades uh, in, in, in ESA. Let me mention some, uh, some obvious ones or some simple ones. Um, one is PRS, uh, the uh, uh, very uh, high accuracy signal of Galileo of for navigation, uh, where we developed the PRS signal for the European Union's uh, constellation. Another one, which you might not uh, even think of, is metrology. Uh, metrology, I just mentioned that we are launching uh, MTG in uh, December. Uh, it's a metrologic satellite. Uh, there's one big geostationary satellite. And then you have, uh, of course, you combine these measurements uh, with uh, 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 system models, uh, weather prediction models, other measurements on the ground, in the air, on the oceans, in order to make a weather forecast. But there's only one satellite to make a forecast uh, for farmers, for tourists, uh, for agriculture, and for the Air Force. Uh, that means uh, the, there is dual use inherently already in the, in the technology. Same for, uh, for polar orbiting uh, radio satellites, and so on. So we have many of those, but we have also launched one a project called uh, Civil Security from Space. We have seen it before, and that's actually really dedicated to using our satellite infrastructure for civil security. Yeah, that's a follow-up to yeah. question. Uh, I was thinking uh, just um, natural disasters that are happening right now, floods, uh, the ocean level pricing and so on. And this is uh, resulting in a lot of people being displaced. So in that sense, uh, you talked about Earth observation. So many of these images that are produced could be of great value for risk mitigation, for acting after uh, emergencies, and so on. Is there any policy at this time that the agency has uh, regarding who has access to, that, to those images? Is there a cost for, those, for the access to those images, and so on? Mm -hmm. You will be happy to hear that all the Copernicus data, and there are 25 terabytes of data every single day which we collect uh, from our satellites, are provided, disseminated free of charge to anyone. You log on to a website, uh, you can download your image of uh, this afternoon uh, from your hometown or where you go on vacation on the weekend. Uh, so they are for free uh, of all the Copernicus data. And that's something that is quite, uh, of course, they are not a very high resolution data. They are not going down 20 or 30 centimeters. They are uh, in the order of uh, very few meters, but they are certainly well, a huge data source for environmental monitoring, for flooding, for forest fires, and many of these applications. So yes, this is something that we provide. Um, and uh, for free, 2021, uh, of any part of the world. And actually, this is the largest, uh, if I uh, remember well, the largest uh, 
data uh, source in terms of volume of data that is disseminated in, in space. Sure. Uh, yeah, hi, thank you for coming to speak with us today. So you were talking a lot about uh, trying to rapidly grow, grow the commercial sector, uh, but in the U.S. we've had a lot of tension recently between NASA and the commercial sector over the workforce, and the quick growth of the commercial sector has really pulled people from NASA, uh, and the commercial folks are kind of winning right now. Uh, so. Do you have any concerns that if you try to rapidly go grow the European commercial sector, that you'll have the same kind of staffing concerns, or that you'll end up not being able to meet international obligations because uh, your agency won't have enough? If we reach this uh, problem, if I may say that uh, so many people are growing up in the commercial sector, I'm very happy. Uh, <laughs> I think that's really that's really a measure of success. Now we don't have this issue today, uh, but uh, certainly I would like to create such a situation where we have more and more commercial entities, uh, commercial companies providing some services, there will, there will always be, um, and I'm quite confident that uh, uh, as ESA, as an organization, we will always attract quite good people because quite often people come to ESA, then they may go into commercial company in order to, to build a bridge uh, uh, technology-wise, uh, but also in many, other, in many other senses. So today it doesn't exist, but if I have the problem, I, I think uh, we've already achieved a big goal. Let me, let me do an actual follow on question though, related, related to that, because this is something that NASA is, you know, is struggling with and it raises a deeper question about what are the what are the capabilities that you want to make sure the ESA always retains in-house? You know, so no one goes to NASA to be the world's best contract officer. Okay. Hopefully they happen, but that's not why they go there. And so people are attracted to come to ESA to do wonderful and amazing things. But do you have a sense about what are the things you want to make sure you always have in-house? What we always should have, and I think NASA is probably not so different in, in that, we should always be the ones who, who work at the cutting edge technology and uh, I would say do the impossible, where industry would not engage because it's too risky, it's too big, or it's simply not, uh, not, not easy to do. And this is something where we, we would always work as ESA, as public entity. But I'm very happy if uh, the commercial sector develops and even ESA retracts and is stepping back and let the commercial sector offer a service which they can offer, uh, we'll say cheaper, faster or, or better. And there are examples coming up now, I mean, uh, in, in the US, but also in Europe in Earth Observation. Mm -hmm. Earth Observation is in a transition phase of, uh, of really commercializing. And many of these uh, satellites that are being developed today in constellations, uh, I wouldn't do any more in ESA, but we have developed them 10, 15 years ago, because I would like to develop the next level the next step of technology that doesn't exist today, uh, which uh, maybe again in 10 years becomes uh, commercial and then I hand it over to the commercial company. So I really, I'm seeing myself as an R&D agency, always investing in, in very difficult technology developments in order to then uh, open the ground for commercial companies or others to really pick up and, and develop it. If they don't pick up, I will stay in as ESA and develop it further if of course it is required by the users. Well, it's a different commercial question. Uh, I mean, thanks, Joseph, for the great description, and also you're doing what you can within ESA about making technology available to companies and speeding up the process, I assume contracting and other things within ESA. Uh, but there's an underlying problem, and that's more societal, cultural, and to what extent do you see ESA influencing the financial banking community, the intermediaries? actually have to provide the money to the company itself. Very good question. I really like that because this is something I, I discuss a lot with our decision makers. But I, if I ask them for 18 billion, uh, I need to tell them why why they should give me so much money. And the first question they, of course, ask me is, what's in it for me? Uh, what do I gain from it? So we're doing a lot of studies, and some of them, I think, we, you know, on the socioeconomic impact of uh, the investments they make uh, on to, uh, to Get the, the long story short, and uh, I think the figures are very similar in the US. If you invest one euro in, in space in Europe, uh, we've done studies for Copernicus, but also other space sectors, on average, the return is three, four, five euros, depending a bit on the different Copernicus. It's even about 10 euros, which is the socioeconomic benefit for, uh, of, of the economy of EU investing. So, yes, this is something that goes much broader because the euro that is invested in building a satellite creates a new company. Uh, that offers new services, that attracts uh, money from uh, the financial community, maybe the insurance company, and really adds 
completely new dimensions that are far outside the space domain. And I think this is something that I really would like to achieve that the space technology is becoming widely used in, in daily life, is becoming common good uh, in many domains and really is integrated in the, in the social fabric of, of uh, society. And I think this is, this is something that I see more and more happening, uh, not in all domains, but uh, certainly in, in, in a number of them, uh, Earth observation, telecom, navigation, other typical ones, but also others. And I think that is something that I really, I'm really pushing forward as, uh, as a wider use of uh, yeah, taxpayers' money for the benefit of the economy. Yeah. Hi, Kathy Bell, Thank you so much for speaking to us today. Um, so, from my understanding, uh, of how ESA allocates funds to different commercial companies is based on how much they need to invest in the state. And then if they receive back, it is, I forgot the term, geo. Geo return. Uh, yeah, exactly. So uh, recently I worked on an acquisition coming from a uh, company in Belgium. When we looked at the stability of their contracts with ESA, they were quite limited to the amount of money that they actually contributed to this budget. Um, also, understanding that to Agencies or other two countries can come together to form their own contract within ESA. Is there any other program or incentive that you provide commercial companies outside of the GEO um, like award that you give uh, to show financial institutions the stability of projects outside of the very good point. Let me just explain a little bit for the others. So you, you probably know it how the ESA funding works. Um, the, the figure I mentioned before is 16.9 to 17 billion. 20% uh, of this is mandatory um, and coming from our 22 member states based on the size of their economy. So if Germany has a larger GNP because they're a larger country, they pay more uh, into ESA compared to Greece or, or Austria or uh, smaller countries. And this is the size of it. But this budget only makes 20% of our budget. The other 80% is what we call optional programs. Optional means I define a program I put it on the table and the member state can or cannot subscribe. They can put zero euros or dollars, zero euros or a lot, depending on how attractive they find the program. That makes it painful for me because we need to define programs that are really attractive to all the member states. Because if I put something on the table that nobody likes, then I don't get the money, very simple. So therefore we need to really make sure that the programs I define that are good for big countries, small countries, Eastern countries, Western countries, Northern countries, Southern countries. So you can imagine from Greece to Portugal, to Germany, to uh, Finland, uh, to uh, Poland. You, you need to get all these countries on board in order for them to find an attractive package at the end of the day. And that's uh, an exercise that is complicated uh, because uh, uh, well, uh, you have to, uh, to define them, negotiate, uh, uh, and we work on, on the preparation of a ministerial for more than a year, very intensely with all these countries to define what we do and how we do it. So this is the the income side of, uh, of, of the money. So once we have the money, uh, in order to spend it, what we do is we are running competitions like uh, anyone else, but overall on this, if Germany gives me 1 billion uh, of, to a certain program, I guarantee Germany that this 1 billion goes back to the industry through a competitive process on average, not immediately, but on average, minus the, the cost of the salaries and the buildings and so on. So that means, and this is the complication. This is the famous uh, GEO return uh, you mentioned. Uh, I need to guarantee that on average uh, of all my money, which we have, six, 17 billion, which we got now, plus the other money, which is already in the pockets, that of all this money in, say, in Earth observation, I guarantee that Germany gets its share back based on what they have put into the book. And the same for Italy and the same for Greece and the same for all the countries. So that's complicated because I have 22 countries on one side, as a matrix, and on the other side, of all the projects that are running here, where they need, I need to get, guarantee them uh, their return back. So yes, this is a, it's complicated. It's a bit of a limitation because if Germany or Belgium is putting 15, they can get only 50 back on average. So, okay, we have variations. It's not so strict. It's always competitive. If Belgium industry doesn't win, then they don't get the contract. Then it's an Italian one. That means Italy is above. Belgium is below. But all, all, I would say over time, on average, I have to average it out. And this is a rule which we have, because this is also a basic rule for me to say, look, this program is attractive. We, we build a, a, a mass rover or whatever. This is attractive. But also, I make sure that your industry is engaged in, in building it. And I'm not buying it, uh, I don't know, somewhere else. Uh, and this is, uh, this is part of the, 
I would say the attraction of uh, for, for for me to then say, look, I have figured out that your industry is capable of doing it, and therefore some of this uh, G return or some of the funding that you give me, your industry potentially can win, but of course they still have to win through good proposals. A question: Does the, the G return apply to all the monies? Because you're really including the mandatory and the optional. Or the G return in principle applies to, across the board to all the funding. All the yeah. Okay. 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 In the back. Yep. Uh, you mentioned that you've been developing the TMT system and lower orbit. Can you talk a little bit more about the timeline for the development? Uh, the timeline, um, this is a relatively small budget now because we built, uh, I think, six to eight satellites, if I remember well, uh, smaller ones to really test the technology. Uh, and this will be three, four years uh, in order to launch them, but it's really to test the technology to improve the navigation signal. If this works, and I'm sure it works, but uh, we will learn by doing uh, these concept studies or these uh, early developments. The goal is then to apply it in a much larger scale uh, as, a, as a large constellation. But uh, what we have funded now is the first step. That means the demonstration of this technology. Yeah. Um, first of all, thank you for your wonderful presentation. My question is, how do we keep the balance divergent and ideas of member states regarding potential lunar resource utilization in present or for future policies? But uh, how does that is a balance? Uh, how does you said balanced divergent ideas and interests of members. <laughs> you know that uh, Bill, Bill Nelson, the, uh, the, the administrator of NASA, calls me the, the Merlin because it uh, needs a bit of magical skills to get all the 22 member states together and balance exactly what we say. No, but uh, joking apart, this is exactly the challenge which we have to get all these 22 member states, big and small, uh, with different uh, interests, different industrial capabilities, different. Uh, political priorities together. And if I propose uh, uh, Argonaut as a European large logistic lender, I want to be sure that at least 80% of my countries like it. Uh, that means uh, that they, they find interest from an industrial perspective, that the industry can work on it, uh, from a scientific perspective, or from a commercial perspective. So all these dimensions have to be Worked, worked out. Uh, I need to know what uh, in this industry, in this country is available in terms of capability and make sure that my rover is designed in a way or my logistic lender is designed in a way that I can address really the needs of, of both, both of these countries. But what helps me a bit is that I have uh, about 40 of these budget lines or, or proposals. So if one, uh, if in one of them, there's nothing there for Greece, for example, there's another one where Greece is very interested as a country uh, and therefore the average has to be of interest to all of these countries. But it's that's a bit of an exercise. I can tell you this is part of the challenge we have. Yeah. So you um you mentioned wanting to rise to the top right of the um capacity and economy scale. And um so back when um the war started in Ukraine, um the decision to blow up X and Y you had a lot of um you had a lot to lose with that. Um, how do you feel that um, ESA has um, power to be a global influence on the world and and around the world? Um, take the, the example of ExoMars. This is really one that um, that has has really uh, caused a bit of pain, if I if I may call it this way. Um, first of all, um, as I said, the 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 rover was ready to be launched uh, in September. And this would be now on its way to Mars uh, and would land shortly and we would drill into the ground. But this would be the situation if there would not, not, not have been the war. Um, the fact that suddenly we had to stop this and, and what, what happened is right when the invasion occurred on the 24th of February, immediately afterwards, I, I consulted with my member states uh, and said, look, we have a problem. Uh, this is a project together with Russia. Uh, we cannot continue. How do we proceed? Because I need their decision. Uh, to, to see how we proceed. And I made a proposal that we suspend the cooperation and then in the second step, we terminated it. So there was immediate um, unanimous support for this proposal, which I made to the member states. So crystal clear, there was no, no issue. So in that case, it was, I would say easy because everyone had exactly the same opinion, but that's not always the case. Sometimes I have uh, proposals where half of them like it or two thirds and the other one that doesn't like it. So then I have to find compromises and ways in between to, to really uh, you know, find a way forward. How this influences geopolitics, uh, because this is part of your, of your question. I mean, certainly um, 
the case of uh, Russia is a very clear one uh, because there we, uh, I think, uh, certainly here in the, in the US, it's crystal clear that uh, corporations uh, had to be de, uh, de uh, entangled uh, uh, because, uh, and, and we had a huge uh, dependency also in terms of technologies uh, from Russia. And there we have gone through a very drastic uh, scheme uh, in, in, in Europe and in ESA to really decouple from uh, Russian partners, suppliers, uh, uh, companies, institutions with whom we have been working. And that, yes, that is an implementation of a geopolitical decision, which also our member states have taken together with the US and other partners to put sanctions on Russia. And we're implementing these sanctions very strictly, very clearly. It's difficult. Uh, let me come back to the ExoMars uh, uh, example. Scientists were ready. To, uh, to wait and analyze, uh, to wait for the data that come down from Mars. So they were very excited that we would launch very soon. Now they have to wait for another six years, seven years until this happens. So big disappointment, the big disappointment in the science community. Uh, our engineers, my own team in ESA, several tens of people are, have been working on ExoMars since 15 years, first with the US, then with Russia. And now again, somehow they did not know what, what will happen in the future. Very difficult. Uh, actually, the project manager uh, has been very frustrated uh, going through all these difficult decisions. Uh, developments uh, with Russia were not easy, believe me, uh, to solve problems. Uh, I was getting involved in, in solving some of the last hurdle, which were more political, uh, to sort it all out. We were all ready for launch. And uh, suddenly, their career, he said, I mean, they have been working for 10, 15 years, sometimes even longer, on building this, uh, this rover. Um, uh, engineering it and waiting for the day to, to launch it and then uh, of course uh, uh, see it successfully launched and this did not happen or is not happening now it's a big frustration and you have also to manage your own staff to explain to them to keep them on board to keep them excited and so on uh, when this happens it happened in february uh, we didn't know what happens to XMAS. there were some countries to say look we have spent so much money so much trouble already uh, it didn't work out uh, let's just put the thing in a museum and we don't want to fly to Mars. I was extremely unhappy about this, uh, these comments. And these were big countries who have been making these uh, suggestions. I said, I'm not accepting that. Uh, I want to find a way forward. I want to find a way to get this rover to the Mars surface. The science is exciting. The engineering is, uh, is demanding. I want to make this happen. And believe me, this was one of the things where you uh, work very hard, uh, thanks also to some of the American uh, partners. We work very hard to make it work, make it happen. And I'm very happy that our member states at the end put the money into the pot in order to, to make it make it possible. So yes, in a way, we have shown, if, I'm, if I translate this into geopolitical language, that uh, even if uh, with uh, Russia as a partner, which we had to drop, uh, we can do it alone, or we can do it with alone with the help of Russia, of, of, uh, sorry, of uh, the US. Okay, uh, sort of, yeah. you're, you're, you're being very kind because uh, you know, in a large way, in, in 2011, you know, we put you in the situation, exactly. uh, and uh, so uh, so we, we, we're, we're kind of responsible for where you are. Uh, so, what can you say of what we either are doing or can do on the U.S. side uh, to help with that Yeah. Well, no, thank you for asking this question. This is something that uh, uh, that is really important. What I um, experienced right at the invasion is that uh, I got immediately um, support from NASA engineers to see what needs to be done and uh, what the technology state of some components is and what uh, Europe can do and what Europe can could do others, but where it is easier or faster if uh, the US could provide some support. And this was uh, work we did immediately with the JPL our uh, colleagues, uh, my teams and the JPL teams work together for months uh, to really you know, just go into the whole architecture of the uh, of ExoMars. That, that is, uh, there are several components, as I mentioned, uh, the transfer vehicle, the lander, and the rover itself. Um, and we had to, for each individual piece, uh, take out the Russian parts and see you know, what can be done in what different way. So we went through this exercise um, to make the long story short. We identified that we could mo do most of it in Europe uh, with European technologies and partners uh, where we have uh, existing uh, capability. Some of it we don't have yet. Uh, and there, uh, this is where the US can step in uh, and support. And uh, okay, in the US, the budget decision has yet to be made because it's not yet in the, uh, it's not yet planned. But this is something I would be grateful if the US could really 
step in on these three components I mentioned uh, to make it uh, the reality. Because if not, then we are really stuck uh, for the second time, as you say. Uh, and then we would need to find European solutions, which would delay uh, the project because we would need to develop the technology. Yeah, I've got two more questions. Thank you very much. I thought we were very quite interesting. The word sovereignty came up a couple of times during the course of the talk. And I was wondering, given that Europe is incredibly reliant on other parts of the world for technology like semiconductor change, I was wondering how that affects the ESA and would you are you satisfied that Europe really mentioned it's doing enough to remedy that? For for semiconductors? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, semiconductors is an issue, uh, you're absolutely right, uh, but there we work with the Commission, uh, as, as you say, uh, they are um, uh, also creating some more autonomy uh, for Europe on semiconductors. I think we are still, we still have some way to go, but uh, yes, this is an exercise we do together with them. Uh. Okay, and one more. Thank you very much. Uh, being shy. Let, let me ask, uh, uh, Something I, I've noticed, and maybe this is just anecdotal, I don't know if it's true or not, to react to it. There was a time when no one could remember names of either American or European astronauts flying on shuttles. They were pretty, not, it was not like the early days, right? And so not, and I've seen that seems to change in Europe, that European astronauts are a lot more famous, they're, they're known in their communities. Is, is that simply because of good PR and outreach that ESA has been doing? Or has something else changed? Uh, what 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 is what has gone on there? Or am I just being optimistic and, and reading that? Well, your your observation is right, huh? but uh, let me say that I mean, as you know, astronauts are superstars. Uh, they are very uh, they're very talented. Uh, they have a lot of qualities, uh, but also have a lot of uh, attention which they get if they speak. And it's always fascinating to listen to astronauts explain uh, how they. How their life in the space station is, uh, how they see climate change uh, from the space station's perspective, and, and it's really it's really fascinating, at least uh, for me. So what I have done is, and this also in the run-up to the preparation of the ministerial, I've really um, engaged them uh, in the process. I went with them uh, to see Scholz or to see uh, uh, Macron. You see top politicians. Uh, actually, Macron is uh, here in Washington right now with two of my astronauts. Uh, because they are such important people and they really can help a lot uh, in, in order to yeah, explain the message uh, because you much easier get access to some people and also the attention of media. Uh, and this is a very deliberate policy which I have implemented in, in, in ESA to work very closely with these astronauts. And the recent uh, um, uh, publication or the recent announcement of 17 new astronauts is also a very important step for me. Some of them career astronauts, which will uh, be prepared to fly on the space station. Others, reserve astronauts, astronauts of the reserve corps, uh, which are waiting for flight opportunities. But while they wait, I would like to engage them as ambassadors in their countries. And this is extremely important and very powerful. This is something sort of NASA has done, I think, for years. Yeah. The kind of blue blue uh, flight jackets and uh, well, other branding items and uh, to do that kind of outreach. But uh, it's been working well. But anyway. Uh, Thank you uh, very much for great questions and uh, for uh, joining us here today. And uh, just a round of applause for our speaker. <laughs>